Holy Spirit, we say thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for never leaving us, for never forsaking us. Thank you. Thank you for, for dwelling within us, God. Thank you for putting up with us. Thank you for your patience and your faithfulness. Thank you for your goodness and your mercy. Father, we're thankful that what two or three are gathered in your name. There you are. Thank you for your presence. And where your spirit is, there is freedom. So we say thank you. God, for every chain that's broken and door that's open, for every oppression that's loose and every captive that has been set free, we say thank you. And we ask you to speak to us today. God, we ask you to direct our steps, God. We ask you to change our understanding, Father. We ask you to continue to change us into the image of the Son of your love to remove every part of us that doesn't look like you. Remove every understanding that doesn't come from you. Every thought and every stronghold and every imagination be cast down in Jesus' name. Father, expose lies that we believe, lies we've been told. Show us the truth of your word. And Father, let us then be able to worship you as you seek such to worship you, both in your spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name, amen. The song said, Let us become more aware of your presence. How many of y'all pray that on a regular basis? God, let me be aware of your presence. You know, if we were aware of his presence in a lot of things, there'd be a lot of things that we would not do. His presence doesn't take a break. His presence doesn't take a nap. He doesn't have a blind eye. If we were more aware of his presence, we wouldn't chase every popularity contest pastor, every viral revival. I don't believe you would chase revival at all if you were aware of his presence. It's the word revival alone, and I know we use it in the church often, but the word revival alone means that something is dead. And how can we apply a term to the moving of God, dealing in something that God, who is life, gave life to? So even by crying to God for revival, we are crying, saying your church is dead. If we think that we have to fly across a nation in order to go to some place that they say there is revival, sounds a lot like John 4 saying, on oh, which mountain do we worship? But the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is in us. Why do I have to fly anywhere? Jesus told me that they would say that he is over there, but do not go. He's in the back room, but do not go. If we were aware what spirit we were chasing, we don't need God to pour out. We need to spring up. That is what Jesus told us, that we would spring up from the inside, rivers of living water. When I ask God to change the atmosphere, I'm not asking him to do it from heaven. I'm asking him to do it from my belly. Which means, if I don't praise, 
then the atmosphere won't shift for me. So anyone crying out, God, change the atmosphere and give revival. Standardly is someone who wants God to change them without worshiping him. And I like that. Let us become aware because there are a lot of spirits in the earth acting like the Holy Spirit. Mocking and mimicking the Holy Spirit causing such confusion that people are accidentally at times blaspheming the Holy Spirit because it is the only unforgivable sin you don't think the enemy tries to weaponize that so if he can mock God and mimic God to where a believer sits back when God is actually moving and say that's not God that's this spirit or that spirit Jesus said hold on you can talk about me get your doctrine wrong that's okay but don't blaspheme the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Yeah. I warn that even the elect would be deceived in these days if they could. Look, we're going to be in, I'm going to start in Revelation. Right. I'm going to read three verses in Revelation chapter 1. Right, then I'm going to jump back to Romans to kind of highlight what's being talked about. It says this in... Um, verse 5 and from Jesus Christ the faithful with the faithful witness the firstborn from the dead and the ruler over the kings of the earth to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and was made and has made us kings and priests to his God and father to him be glory and dominion forever and ever amen behold he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him and they who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him even so amen let him mourn even so amen they gonna weep even so amen he says that he has made us kings and priests when it says there's a there's a principle in greek language that when you see that and between the words, it's really not an addition. It is a tie together. Not saying that these are two separate things, that it's this and this. But these two things are applied to the, to the subject matter that you are both king and priest. Right? So when you see terms like Lord and Savior, it's not he's the Lord and he's the Savior. Lord and Savior. God and Father is one. That's a, that's a Greek linguistic principle. Just wanted to say that let you know you are both king and priest. In Romans 8, I'm going to read 9 through 11 and then 14 through 21. Jump around a bit just for this purpose of this revelation verses to connect, show you what we're talking about. It says, uh, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you if indeed the spirit of god dwells in you now if anyone does not have the spirit of christ plain and simply he is not his if you don't got the spirit of christ he is not his i don't care if you read his bible he is not his i don't care if you go to church he is not his. I don't care if he, if he uh, is on the praise team. He is not his. I don't care if, if he tithes faithfully. He is not his. If you're dating somebody that ain't got his spirit, guess what? He is not his. And if Christ is in you, if Christ is in you, then the body is dead because of sin. But the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Verse 14 says, for as many as are led by the spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. 
the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God and if children then heirs heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ hence you are kings and priests if indeed we suffer with him that we may also be glorified together for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope, because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. You may be seated. So in Romans 8, we get a picture of how we came into this priesthood, how we came into this kingdom, and where that kingdom will be and how it operates. That the creation itself is going to be delivered. Somebody say the creation. This right here that we're in is going to be delivered. It's going to be set free from the bonds of decay for us. Jesus is, it tells us about Jesus in Revelations. It says he's coming in the clouds and every eye going to see him, even those who pierced him. Um, give me a minute to work out where I'm walking because I'm kind of... The, the text I picked that I chose is really kind of contextual text because I don't really have a solid text that I wanted to walk out from today. I just had something in my spirit because I've been kind of drawing a line in the sand recently between this world and God's kingdom, right? And I've been consistent with it because we've been told one thing for so long, ever since we were children, then we hear something new for the first time. And, and if you hear it once, you revert right back to Right. And we don't want to live our life as a dog that returns to his own vomit. We want to be delivered. Why would we ever go back to the understanding we've been delivered from? Why would we say, yes, we are kingdom and go back to living like slaves? Yes, we are heirs. Make me a servant in my father's house. Why would that be the doctrine we decide to hold on to and let the world use us rather than, you know what, render to Caesar was Caesar's? And we give to God what is God's, whose image is on that coin, right? Whose image is on you? And so, so we have been taught this, but we have been uh, not taught how to walk in it and tricked about how we operate in it. So I, I've been kind of drawing this line in the sand. One thing I've seen in scripture is that when Moses was on his way, and when I mean on his way, I mean being born, right? When he was on his way, uh, Pharaoh in an attempt to preempt the deliverance, murdered all the boys, two years old and younger, had them killed. Moses was saved by his mama who, who hid him and then put him in a, in a basket and slid it down the river. But there was an attack from the enemy at the entrance of a deliverer. When Jesus was on his way, Herod decided well, he's going to kill all of the little babies, two years old and younger, trying to preempt the entrance of the deliverer. Because we know that the enemy always tries to attack a thing in its infancy. In the beginning, introduce the lie in the beginning. Adam and Eve, here come the serpent. Try to catch it in the beginning, because if you can corrupt it in the beginning, you can control the end of a thing. So, so if I know that, then I know that there is a, a deliverer that is coming back. There is another entrance that is coming. But he's not coming through a woman anymore. Bible say he coming in the clouds. The angel said in this like manner that you see him going, he'll come again. So now if we know that the deliverer is coming in the clouds, what do we expect the enemy to attack? He has shown his pattern to attack the entrance of the deliverer. So now suddenly, we got objects all over the sky. <laughs> suddenly, we got balloons and orbs and UFOs and shooting stars and Project Blue Beam is in full effect. 
so that when he comes in the sky, you won't even be impressed with him. Because the world is in the business of offering the counterfeit. It's all about the counterfeit. Presenting like, right? So up until the 1600s, no one had a problem with God. Um, and what I mean God, I mean the concept of God in general, yeah. right? Uh, atheism wasn't a big deal in, in the first century, you know, second century, thirds, all of, up through the 1600s. No one has ever questioned whether Jesus was real or not. That's, that's, a, that's a 19th century inquiry. That's a 20th century mainstream problem where it was really introduced that Jesus wasn't historically real. No historian has ever doubted that from the first century all the way through the 1800s. First 1600 years BC, uh, we don't have problems with the idea of God. And then what happens after that is they began to push God out slowly the 17th century, 18th century. We go through, historically, the Age of Enlightenment, which they, they nicknamed and dubbed the Age of Reason. So when they say things like you want to be enlightened, you understand while they're playing spiritual with your wording, they're really talking logical what you're thinking. They want you to be more naturalistic, that you're enlightened when you stop believing in God and start believing in self this inner power you have right and, and so this age of reason replaced God with arithmetic replaced God with intellect and and as they went through this period all the way through to you know through to like 18 15 um, other religions didn't start taking a real mainstream you know there were other religions in the earth before that but really start taking a mainstream um, coming back out all of these religions, when you look at them, they're all just like a little piece of God. Yes. Yes. They, they're just like a piece of God, where they all offer just a little bit of piece of something to make you feel like they, you're going to get a higher knowledge of the heavens or the way things move in the spirit. But just enough to, to get your attention, but not enough to do anything more than that. None of them actually have a full-blown absolute truth in them none of them but ours ours is the only unchanging front to back all of it connects none of it contradicts ours is the only one that does that so they had to push ours out and introduce these pieces in different names and then delegate the idea of absolute truth to individuals meaning because there's no absolute truth in these religions you get to decide what's true. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. True is subjective. It's my truth. Right. So even if it don't make sense, it makes sense to me. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So truth is not, uh, is not objective anymore. It's subjective. And as they continue to, to, to push God out, they push God more and more out of society um, as if he was some old idea and inactive. As if he was elderly and incompetent, you know, and, and, and they, they took God and, and, and encouraged us to take God and put him in an assisted living facility. Is this good? Don't worry, it's going to get worse. That's the best it gets right here. I'm throwing it all out early to get your attention so they don't log off at YouTube. Um, <laughs> no, <laughs> put him in, a, in an assisted living facility and we called that the church yeah. we're going to take God out of being active in the world because that's an old idea right. you can have him in your facility yeah. and just like putting someone in that facility time to time once a week maybe you can stop in and visit him <laughs> maybe but you spend more time talking to the, the nurse or the facilitator about what they did all week rather than visiting the patient or, or, the, or God himself. And then you leave, uh, they teach us that, that, that we should leave the responsibility of dealing with God at that facility with the administrators or the staff of that facility. It's the pastor's job. 
it's the minister's job to study this word. I'll come in and get the, the cliff notes of whatever he studied. And they, like I said, then they, they change what is true because now you've moved absolute truth out. You get to de declare what's true and then you forget what the scripture says, which is let every truth be established by two witnesses. Don't tell me it's your truth if there ain't another witness. Don't tell me uh, this, is, this is good for me if there ain't another witness to it. They told us we had to be tolerant of every other religion and faith while they themselves were intolerant and without apology for us and our belief they told us that we had to be inclusive while they were exclusive society pushed our ideas told us that pushing our ideas on people um, that we pushed it on them and forced it on them in a way to shame us as they push their ideas on everybody via education, programming on the television, music, advertisements. Uh, they just force it on you. And they offered us then a like kingdom. A like kingdom. A kingdom like his kingdom. A like kingdom without a king. What if you could have everything that you believe the kingdom is about, but don't have to yield to a king. I mean, weren't you guys supposed to be a nation without a king anyway? So they offer us a light kingdom. The light kingdom uh, turns around and looks like this. Um, we're going to have programs to ensure peace. Don't you want peace? That means peace internationally. That means peace within the nation. We're going we're to have forces to drive around and ensure peace in your neighborhood. Aren't you people all about peace? Isn't that what's in the coming kingdom? Uh, we're going to make sure that, that, that everyone has a place. And you think that means that everyone has a place. But what that means is inclusion which is just a fancy misused word for we're going to tell you what you're going to have with you. But they branded it in the language of it's inclusive. All are welcome. Come as you are in this kingdom. Anyone can be anything they want to be in this kingdom. They, they pushed a kingdom of justice because the kingdom of God, with him being a just God, justice must be a part of the kingdom. And with the American dream, you can be anything you want. Prosperity. You can make as much money as you want. If you work hard enough, you can have a car. If you work hard enough, you can have this type of house. If you work hard enough, you can dress like this, go to these places. There is no limit on your prosperity. You're only as prosperous as you decide to be or not to be. Um, it's, it's, it's a crazy idea. They, they said, in this kingdom, we'll have programs for the poor. Because I know you like to feed the poor. We'll have programs for the needy. Because I know you got to take care of those widows and those orphans. Programs to make sure we have secured the elderly. Yeah. Yeah. Come on in to the kingdom. We're going to educate everybody. Health care for everybody. Man, that sounds like a great kingdom. That sounds like the millennium kingdom. That sounds similar to what our king says we're going to have for a thousand years. That no one will be sick anymore. That when we get there, we know all things. That, that there be peace and there be joy and there be just like, like there be no wrong. So then the weak can say that they're strong. And the poor can say that they're rich. And that's this kingdom that's coming. And they're saying, hey, we offer a light kingdom like that. And they throw with God forced out of the scene, but put in the background. You can have your visits there and be in this kingdom and feel like you have actively brought his kingdom here. 
This is how they tricked the church over a couple of hundred years. Where the church traded in kingdom for light kingdom. And has reduced being kingdom minded to churches working together for an outreach. That's kingdom. That's kingdom? <laughs> hey, I read a lot about kingdoms and dynasties. And I ain't never seen this dynasty get with this dynasty and this to say, hey, let's have an outreach. <laughs> that don't sound like kingdom. <laughs> this king get with that king and they, they have an outreach. That ain't, that ain't kingdom. Uh, uh, let, me, let me use your building. That's kingdom. That ain't kingdom. That's borrowing. The borrower is slave to the lender. <laughs> that ain't kingdom. That's slavery. So they think it's, they just reduce kingdom to any time two Christians can work together without being in competition with each other. No, that's body. That's not kingdom. And they say we have this kingdom. Just ignore everywhere where this stuff don't really work. Just ignore where we use these peacekeepers to take advantage of you. Just ignore where we collect your money to take care of these needy, but we, we take most of it for something else and let them scrape by. Yeah. Just ignore where there is really uh, no justice for the poor. Yeah. Right. Only justice for who, who can afford it. Yeah. Where there really is no peace because we're always in a war. Where there really is uh, no, no real health care because you're too old for good health care. Yeah. What, you two months pregnant? That baby's too young for good health care. Matter of fact, we'll just call health care euthanasia and abortion. It's, it's, it's the old bait and switch. And so the church jumps on board and social justice has become the call of the church. More than repent, it's lobbying. It's petitions and marching with no calls to repent because the kingdom of God is at hand. No one calling out sin because it's taking you to hell. We've been talking about on fire. If you don't get saved, you're going to be on fire. <laughs> well, we, they offered us the light kingdom without the king. Hijacked the points and replaced them with mirrored counterfeits. So in one, there is a creator. We come from that creator. We have his image and his nature. But in the other one, we come from the created thing. And we have what they say that an animal nature? And we look like monkeys? This is what they want us to see. And when you, when, you can't, when, when you can't be bought with the fantasy of the pictures they draw in the science books, they just put Tarzan out there so you can see man and monkey living together and act like we came. They just put out there, planet of the apes. They, they, just put it out there. One, you came from the creator. The other, you evolved from the created. One, you have this nature. The other, you have this nature. And one, we understand the power of love. And in the other, there's only the love of power. And one, we understand uh, strength by truth. And the other, we understand truth by strength. It's true because I said it's true. It's, it's, it's a mirror image. It's, it's, it's backwards. And one, you seek riches, and God is just added to you. Right? You go, you go after what you want, and you just keep God close behind. And the other, you seek the kingdom, and all these things get added to you. It's... Then you get this idea because some people see it and some people don't. And some people have made their bed in this kingdom with God as their side piece and are happy with it. That if you confront their relationship and tell them about marriage and what marriage really should be, they'll argue with you and say, well, you have your marriage how you have it and I have mine how I have it. 
You say, why do you have two accounts? Aren't y'all one? Well, we do our money the way we do it, and it ain't none of your business. Why do y'all sleep in separate bedrooms? We do them, and there's an argument about cover. Marriage is only a piece of paper anyway. Your relationship's yours, mine's is mine's. And this is how the church looks right now, from denomination to denomination to denomination, to those who aren't submitted to anything, to social media, and all of this is the problem, is the church is having an earthquake. The church is having an earthquake because we are all bricks or a piece of the rock that he is building his church on. And a kingdom that is divided, Jesus said, cannot stand. Why not? Because if a brick is pushing itself out of the building and away from the other bricks and they're pushing back, the whole building is shaking. So unless the Lord build the house, those that build it labor in vain. Because there's a shaking. And we want, it's, 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 it's crazy because we want the results today of a believer. How many of y'all want the results of a believer? I mean, it's big results. These signs shall follow them that believe. They're going to cast out demons, heal the sick, raise the dead, walk amongst the serpents, drink any deadly thing. No ways will it harm them. Man, I want, I want believer benefits. I want to forget not all his benefits. How he, how he healed all my diseases, forgave all my iniquities. I want the benefits of the believer. But today we have a church that, that, that wants all of the results of the believer without ever having to have the faith of a believer. How you want the results without the responsibility of having the faith for it? Somebody say, I do got faith. Do you got the faith of the kingdom or the light kingdom? Because faith would be two different things then, wouldn't it be? And, and they teach us all of this faith. And, and I just made a note, what is faith? Because most people think of faith, when they think of it, they think of wishing really hard. They think of, 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 of declaring it and talking it over and over until they believe it. But the Bible said, Paul said, we believe, therefore we speak. Not I speak it to convince myself of it. No, 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 no. Me talking about it ain't going to make me believe it. You, that's why you, should, you just shut your mouth and only talk about what you already believe. If you was quiet except for 100% of what you believe coming out of your mouth, then you would really know where to confront yourself and where to go fix a thing. Because you would have to acknowledge the doubts you have in other areas. And so, so we, we, what is faith? Is, is faith? is faith really like hoping for it? Because a lot of people don't, they're like, what's the difference in hope and faith? But there's obviously a difference. These three remain. Hope, faith, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Paul was a, a, a smart man. I would not say he's the smartest of all the disciples. Right? Peter was a fisherman. You know, when you deal with Peter and John, they said, aren't these unlearned men? They ain't say that about Paul. <laughs> Paul was a Pharisee and a Roman, and, and he was the top of his class. You know? <laughs> so he had, he, had, he had elevated so fast, so young, faster than all of his statesmen, he said. So then what is faith? Here's what faith is, and it's very simple. In the kingdom, here's what faith is. Faith is knowing. Faith is knowing. Somebody say knowing. 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 Knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt knowing. That's faith. Uh, knowing because I believe the word of God so much that I know everything written in it is 100% true. I know it. So, so what, do I, what do I know about salvation? I know that if I believe in my heart, I know that if I confess with my mouth that he is Lord and died for my sin and was raised from the grave, I know that I'm saved. I know that my sin has been paid for. Therefore, because I'm in his spirit, my sin is dead in my flesh. So I know then, since I have that same spirit, he'll give life to my body. I know the only reason my body is animated right now is because he has given life back to it through his spirit which is life I know that now you can show me a chart with my heart beat and I don't care it takes faith to believe that you made a, a machine that goes beep 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 I could do that 
that's faith to think that that's actually measuring something, right? I mean, I got to believe the doctor. I got to believe the inventor. I got to believe the technology. I got to believe your EKG really does what you say it does. I got to believe that pill that you're trying to hide. It's more writing about what will kill me about that pill than the writing that's going to tell me what's going to help me about that pill. But you show me that. Show me the small print that still is bigger than the big print. No, it takes faith to take that, to just swallow that death and walk away from it. Thank God, thank God people taking medicine, a lot of them as believers, because otherwise they'd be dead just from taking a pill that was prescribed to them. Faith, faith is knowing. Because, because I believe this word, I know exactly where I'm headed. I know exactly how this world is built. I know exactly how my God is formed, how he formed us, or, or what he has planned. I know according to his word. I know it. Hence, faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the word. So now I know because I heard it and I believe it. And because that, I know it to be true, period. And you can't convince me anything else. And I'm not wavering from knowing back to believing. I stepped off of believing into knowing. I believe this word and based on that now I know this. And when I say I believe it, it's not believing as in hoping for. It means I trust it to be true. I trust it to be true. So I know this based on that. Faith is, is knowing beyond what is obviously presented to us on a constant time period over and over as true. I know beyond what you present to me over and over. What I can see, you say this is obviously true. No, 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 no. I know, hence, I don't walk by sight. I walk by what I know, not by what you show. That's why someone can stand before you and try to tell you a lie and the Holy Ghost say, no, this is the truth. Because it said when you turn to the left or the right, you'll hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way. Walk in it. So your words are saying one thing, but the Spirit of God said, this is true. The TV said one thing, but the Spirit of God said, no, that's not true. Those are liars. Those are liars who have your attention. Those are, those are liars. They look like newsmen, but they're really just dancers and actors reading you news they are playing a role you know, and someone will say well, well, well prove it if you know that then prove it <laughs> I tell your mama to prove it um, I'll prove it faith is my evidence Show me the evidence. I'm telling you what it is. This is what I know. And this is what I know. And that's my evidence. And I don't need any more than that. That's the evidence. So when you can't see it, listen to what I'm telling you. I say, why, why do I have to have hope for this then if you know it? Well, hope should come from faith. Faith is the foundation or the substance of hope. I can't hope for what I don't know to be real already. What do I mean by that? It's, it's, see, there's a difference because the Bible says hope that is seen is not hope. I didn't say I didn't say I got hope for what I seen. I said what I know is the basis of my hope. I, I only know it by the word that I have heard. I ain't seen it yet. And, 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 and think of it like this. How many parents in the room? Good. The whole room. <laughs> if, if you tell your children when I get home from work and you can fill in the blank you could be going for ice cream going to a movie going to the mall to get them the shoes going on a vacation we going to Disney World no, there's anything that you, 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 you give them a word now they know that you keep your word they know you have never lied to them they know your track record so now they know when you get home from work, we going to do dot, dot, dot. You know what they're doing all day? Hoping, hoping about it. They got hope at what, what it's going to be. I hope they got this size shoe. I hope they got this flavor ice cream. I hope it ain't no lines in front of that ride. I hope, I hope dad got extra money for the popcorn and the drink and the movie. Hope, 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 hope based on what they know. 
Because if you have hope without, without faith, if you have hope without knowing, what you have is an imagination. That ain't hope. And the Bible says that we should cast down imaginations. So, faith, we don't want to have this faith, though. We don't want to know what we're supposed to know. You can't even talk about NASA without a Christian getting mad at you. <laughs> you can't talk about the firmament. <laughs> and so you have this new kingdom that's like a kingdom, that the king ain't the focal point of this kingdom. And, but they got something involved with him. In this light kingdom, people end up with a platonic relationship with God. Where they like having light conversations, but they've redefined intimacy to them talking about what's deep to them. And they avoid all real romantic connection and relationship and becoming one. That's a very edited way because we have young people in the, in the room. But, but it's, I can come and, and, and I can tell you my problems. And I can talk to you and we're close but we're not intimate. He's my friend, just not my husband. I don't have any romantic interest in this one. So the God of this world don't have to be jealous of me hanging out with my friend-zoned God. I say light kingdom. Light kingdom. You know what they do in this kingdom? They mock our God. And in doing that, if we aren't even aware, we just, we just take the, the training and the language of the Chaldean. And, and so, like I was sitting there thinking about having some recreation. What do y'all do for recreation? Come Chill. I hear chill. Light the fire. Drink some coffee. Chill. Right? Somebody goes fishing, right? Who, who goes fishing for Ozzy goes fishing? What do y'all do for recreation? Somebody play pickleball, bowling, bowling, pickleball, book reading, camping, just lounging. Right? <laughs> but I think that it's funny that they would take a word that really defines what God does in us when we are born again. Okay. Okay. All things pass away, old things pass away, and all things become new. We become a new creation. God had a creation, and then through Christ, he had a recreation. So we are a recreation. Of newness recreated in his image recreated sons of God recreated and they have turned such a phenomenal exchange of resurrection resurrection power to recreation meaning you ain't doing nothing so after you are recreated on new newly born you ain't got to do nothing just chill it's all done. Now you just got to get to heaven. Just chill. You understand? We are a new creation. A recreation. Anyone who's got something to say to me, my answer is I'm a new creation. I don't care what you think. Let me tell you what I'm not. I'm not awakened. Don't let no pastor preach awakening to you. I'm not awakened. I'm a new creation. Waking up, there is nothing, there is nothing exciting about being awakened. Uh, when they ate the fruit, their eyes was open. Ain't nothing excited about that. Even the prodigal son was in the pig pen when he came to himself. Now, I didn't say he awoke, it, it used a whole different, but he came to himself. But look, that wasn't the saving part. He still had a slave's mind. 
it was the father's work and the fatted calf that was slain that restored him to sonship and if the waking up was enough for the household the father wouldn't have met him off the porch with the new clothes and shoes and fatted calf and ring so don't tell me about being awakened i'm not awakened i'm new I was dead and now I'm alive. And that's what the father said to the other brother. Your brother was dead. And now he lives. I'm not, I'm not enlightened. I don't need to be enlightened. I don't want to hear about enlightenment. I don't want to meditate in my chakras. And I don't want to uh, burn sage and incense. And I don't want to learn how to work this and that. And bliggity blah blah. I'm not enlightened. I'm newly created. I am a new creation. I am, I am not, I don't have a Christ consciousness. I don't have Christ consciousness. I'm a new creation. <laughs> See, new from God. Like God made me new. Uh, this newness that the whole world is trying to keep you, to keep God in the back burner by telling you, you just have to awake or be enlightened or have a Christ consciousness because everything you need is in you. I don't want to be an awoke version of the dead man I was. That's a zombie. This ain't the night of the living dead. I'm new. I don't got it in me to take myself to a higher level. You know, the highest level I can go with my own self through all meditation that doesn't include God, even through every spirit of the air, the highest I can ever go is to his low point. Last I checked, scripture said that when the war in heaven happened, that they were cast down and there was no place in heaven found for them. Which means if they ascended to the heavens right now, they'd fall right back out of it. I'm made in his image, right? I'm made in his image. So, so I look like him. You look like him. Um, all this plastic surgery people get to change the image of God. You don't like your nose? What, did God make a mistake with it? You don't like your cheekbones? Did God make a mistake with it? No. You don't like your chin? Did God make a mistake with it? No. You don't like your jawline? Did God? Oh, it makes you look more manly. Ah. You want to look more manly? Pay your bills. <laughs> you want to look more manly? Open the door for your wife. You want to look more manly? Uh, uh, defend your children. You want to look more manly? Stand in the house of God and declare the word of God. Thus saith the Lord. Your jaw, your little plastic jaw. You just went and tried to destroy the image. I'm made in the image of God. You're made in the image of God. That means then it's great so that when we look at each other, we see him. That way I can respect you and treat you right and honor you because I don't want to dishonor you, dishonor him. And I know if I say it to you, he right there. He right there he, he, because, because he's so much on your face that I feel like when I'm saying it to you, I'm saying it to him. I, I'm, I'm made in his image and so are you so that when he demonstrates his glory through you or through me, I don't get the credit and you don't get the credit. They see the image of God. He made us in his image so that when he demonstrates his glory in the earth through us, they know who did it. Can't mistake that kingdom. But this kind of talk, this that conspiracy theorist talk, Talk that talk. See, 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 here, here, here's the thing. I read the Bible. Y'all all read your Bible, right? People always ask me how I study. And I just really don't know what to tell them. <laughs> you know, I'm like, well, you know, I open it up and the pages start dancing. <laughs> They're like, read me, read me. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> that's what it is. We have a relationship with God. When you start reading, he starts talking. 
And so you could be in the wrong, wrong, but as you're reading and, and he starts talking, he'll take you to somewhere else. It's, it's the living word. I have never read my Bible and did not hear his leading. Never. And I make sure before I open it, God, let me hear your voice in here. Walk me through it. I don't understand it. This is your word. And your thoughts are higher than my thoughts. And your ways are higher than my ways. So if I take this and put it on my ways, I'm going to diminish the power of your thoughts. So take, show me how to bring me up to where you are. Then I start reading. I read the Bible um, with the investigation of a conspiracy theorist. That's how I read the Bible. I'm going to figure this out. What you, who you been working with, Lord? <laughs> what Isaiah had to say about me. So you had Isaiah do this with this one and that one. And I read with, it, with that type of investigation because his word tells me that all things work together for the good. So he made it to where it all worked together. And it tells me that he sets the kings up. And he sets the kings down. So God, and you put people in authority for certain times and remove them and had them interact. And so when you had this one kill this one, or when you had Nebuchadnezzar take over Israel, this was all part of, of a conspiracy theory that of you working all things together. He says that he knows the thoughts that he thinks towards us, right? Those thoughts are to prosper us and not to harm us, uh, to give us a hope and a future, which means you said you knew the end from the beginning because you had a hope for the future so that hope is based on knowledge of what you already know so if you knew that back here then I can't read this without understanding that first this is I just go based on what the scriptures say you know, he told us that all these things were written before any day ever came to be or, or that he thwarts the purposes of man because his purposes prevail and that he knew this 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 beginning from the end from the beginning he knew it all at this boom at the same time so when I investigate the scriptures I'm seeing what's all working together. There ain't one verse independent of itself in the Bible. But watch the forked tongue of the enemy. You conspiracy theorists. Like it's shameful. That's one side of it. They try to make it like it's shameful for you to think like that. Um, question. I have a question. When did the vigilante, excuse me, vigilante, I can't read my own writing. Vigilant. There ain't no E on vigilant, is it? I wrote vigilante down. <laughs> Autocorrect. I knew Apple was for the devil. No. <laughs> Here's my question. When did the vigilant, I'm going to read my question so I don't mess it up. <laughs> when did the vigilante, no. When did the vigilant who watched, everything the watchful vigilant when did the vigilant who watched and had then theories of conspiracies become more despised than the deceiver who sat and created strategies with conspirators is it shameful for me to be aware and vigilant like god told me to be pray and watch the one who is vigilant when on my return you know, if you knew the hour of your Lord's coming. So I'm vigilant. He told me what signs to look for. So I'm vigilant. When did the vigilant, who then came up with theories of all these conspiracies, seeing it according to this, become more despised than the deceiver that sat down with people and actually strategized with these conspirators? So it's shameful for you to figure it out. It's acceptable for them to run over people. Question, when did theorizing become bad? Now, this is not a message about that, but you understand that if you turn off your investigation and vigilance when you read scripture, mm -hmm. you're going to miss a lot. And you don't turn it off while you're reading. You turn it off when you've been mocked about it enough. So you try to not think like that or present like that. And then you come and try to figure out what's all working together in scripture. And you can't even find the right cross reference no more. What's the problem with theorizing? Um, I mean, let's talk about theory. 
They teach us the Big Bang Theory. And ain't nobody mad at them. No problem with those theories, right? The theory of evolution, no one's mad at them. The theory of gravitation, no one's mad at Isaac Newton. But if it's the theory of conspiracy, shameful. So theorizing is okay unless I figure you out. But watch, but, but watch this, watch this. Here's the forked tongue on top of shameful. And I'm so sick of this. <laughs> it's the other side. Conspiracy theorists has become a badge of honor. People like it now. Yeah, I'm a conspiracy theorist. I guess all the conspiracy theorists were right after all, right? And it has become a badge of honor that people wear more prouder than the badge of believer. So, on one side of that forked tongue is shameful, the other side is prideful. <laughs> Why call me a conspiracy theorist and not simply a brother in Christ? Especially if you're a believer. Why would a believer look at another believer and say, oh, you're a tinfoil hat? No, I'm a brother in Christ. And based on that, we have a foundational truth here that we can disagree on all the thoughts we think of the earth, but we can't disagree on what we share in the spirit. Right. And the so, so this has a reputation of truth higher than me. So at what point do you lay down the reputation of Jesus and his spirit being in me for a worldly term that you want to look down on? And if you and if if this right here ties us together in truth, then why don't you believe anything I say? It's a crazy idea. When did when did the trust for what we have in Christ become overthrown by the trust someone has in the government? Overlook the truth of the Bible, but say the government won't never lie to us. They don't lie to us, y'all. <laughs> and, and, and when I preach like this, I know there's some people that ain't quite figured out yet if, they're, if they are a believer or a Republican. <laughs> or if they're a believer or a Democrat. I, I know they can't figure out which side they fall on. And so, so they get mad because they want to be a patriot for Babylon and they want to be a believer for the kingdom. And I don't really understand how you could do both. And let me just be clear, because I, I was in the military when I was deceived, and I served it faithfully when I was deceived, and I fought in Iraq when I was deceived. I almost caught Saddam Hussein myself. But the guy next to me was faster. But the thing is, no one is excited to see the demise of America. But we are excited to see Babylon fall. We are excited for idols to come down. We are excited for sorcerers to be dethroned. We are excited for the lies that have been over us in the air to be cast down. Let me tell you something. The ground underneath my feet will be the same after the spirits of the air are cast down. It has nothing to do with the demise of, of, of America. It's Babylon. It's the light kingdom. This, the, what's going on in this world. And, and here's the thing, because we are preparing for a real kingdom. Not an imaginary kingdom, a real kingdom. I'm not, I'm not preparing uh, for a cartoon to fall out of the air. I'm talking for a real kingdom that's coming on earth as it is in heaven. And between the two, the kingdom and the light kingdom, one of them stands on the resurrection and the other stands on you won't die, die. Our kingdom is built on the resurrection. So the serpent came out the gate like you won't die because you got to die to resurrect. So they're trying to keep you out of, he's trying to keep you out of Christ from the beginning. And, and in this coming kingdom, this is what I, I know. Let's wake up. Is that God ain't coming to rescue us. He ain't. Anybody waiting on a rescue? You got the wrong God. He ain't coming to rescue us. Um, he did that already. We were bound to sin. 
It had a hold on us. The grave death had a hold on us. And he came and he rescued us. The rescue happened already. Uh, now he's coming not to rescue us, but to reign with us beside him. He's not coming in to, to, to save us. We, he's coming with his kingdom to what is his. Anyone waiting for a rescue and ain't waiting to reign has a wrong mindset, is managing wrong, and when you get there, you ain't going to be made ruler over no city because you're too busy burying your stuff waiting to be rescued. And I'm going to tell, tell you how you can tell the difference, at least when it comes to the things of God, is that, is that uh, rulers look like rebels in kingdoms that aren't theirs. This is why we can identify the, the, the dark side of things, witchcraft, because rebellion is as witchcraft. Because they are trying to operate as rulers and principalities and powers in, in a kingdom that's not theirs. So it comes off as a push away and rebellion. Well, on the flip side, we're in this world, but not of this world. So as a ruler, me walking around knowing I'll never bow to the rulers of this world. Me walking around knowing I will never submit to the principalities and powers of the air. Me knowing that, that what you say I have to do, if it contradicts this, I will never do it. Oh, great king, my God is to deliver me, is able to deliver me from this. But if he doesn't, rulership looks like rebellion in a kingdom that's not yours. So when I stand as an ambassador in the kingdom of the enemy, I'm going to stand against everything that he runs his world by. I'm not in rebellion, but I look like I'm in rebellion. That's how people say, oh, well, you got to submit to the governing of the law of the land. Okay, I'm cool with the law of the land, but not this admiralty law of the sea. That's what this is, admiralty law, right? Because the beast came from where? Out of the water. So, I, um, we get a picture of this coming kingdom. And, 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 and we get a picture on how we're supposed to be. I love the way God orchestrated everything. You know, Jesus' life projects the plan. Like his life projects the plan. You, you can't look at Jesus' life without thinking about the coming king. You can't look at the birth of Christ without thinking about the coming kingdom. If you do that, if you, knowing that he knows the end from the beginning, it's all tied together that if you try to individualize his life from his return, you're going to miss most of what he came for. Most of the parables Jesus taught dealt with the end. When he said the kingdom of God is like an unto. He talks about the manager coming back from a faraway land. He talks about coming back with his kingdom. He talks about coming back to his vineyard. He talks about uh, the reapers throwing these into the fire. He talk he's not talking about you getting a raise on your job. So the life of Jesus projects the entirety of the plan. Right? And it's beautiful to watch. This is why we celebrate a passion week. Y'all familiar, right? Passion week. It's that last seven days before the crucifixion and resurrection. You know, come the Passover, all of that seven days. Passion week, we call it. You know what we call it in the end times? The tribulation. Those seven days, these seven years. Uh, and we gets on that cross, and what happens, because there's a crossing over. There's a, there's a, there's a, a death where flesh dies and goes no further. Because in the end, we're going to take off this mortality and walk into his kingdom. There is then the resurrection of the body. And his body comes out of the grave, but it ain't the same body that went in. So we're going to shed this because it's not the body that's coming out of this side into that side. But... It's a very real body he comes out in. It's not a spirit. So anyone who thinks that after this we turn into some floating spirit and phantom. No, no, no. We have a real body. It just is immortal now. We took off the mortal body that's a slave to decay. And we put on an immortal body that is eternal. But it's very much still physical. It's physical enough 
it, watch this, it's physical and spiritual, both uniquely fit, that he can walk in this realm and fit in and in the heavens and fit in. That, 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 the, that the eternal body that, that we walk out in is one because at that point, heaven is on earth. Right? The kingdoms are on earth as is in heaven. So when we walk into it, we have to be able to uniquely survive here and there because it becomes one place. Jesus shows us this. It's, 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 it's so amazing that, that his body, this, this is the kind of body we're going to get because this is the body he got and he is our example, right? He's the prototype. So, so, so he, he steps up and we see then that his body remains knowledgeable of what it went through. He says, go ahead and put your hands in the holes. But his body ain't ripped to shreds. But his body is not without knowledge of the experience he just walked through. See, a lot of people think that, that when we get there, what's it going to be? Are we going to remember where we come from? Are we going to know our family? Are we going to know this, this, that, blah, blah, blah. And we have all these questions. But if we just look to Jesus, we will understand that, that his body has a remembrance of the experience. Yeah. Yeah. His body, uh, when, he, when, he, when he crossed over, he remembered everything he ever said to them. Yeah. Yeah. Which means I'm not going to forget my time here. He said, don't, don't you remember when he said? And he ran them through the scriptures on the road to Emmaus. It's, it, when he goes back to Peter, he don't forget who, who denied him. Or, or he goes back to Peter and said, Peter, do you love me? Yeah, he remembers all the experiences as he stepped over. It's a body that, that while it's spiritual, it's physical enough to eat, breathe, be touched, have conversations. But it's unbound by decay. It's unbound uh, to, to destruction. It's unbound to physical limitation. Was he walking through rooms? Jesus, he shows us what the end is, coming out of one and into another. So, so, so when he comes and he walks out, we understand now then, that when he walks out of that grave, we have our king, who's also our priest. And the temple. He is the prototype. And then he tells us, You're kings and priests and the temple of the Holy Ghost. He shows us, even when he walked the earth with, the, with, with his spirit within him, that that's what you're going to be. That's what you're going to be. And, and so, so we see that word, when he said kings and priests, that word, that word king means a sovereign. You are sovereign, a king. Makes you think of people who say, I'm a sovereign citizen. They say, I ain't a citizen of the United States. I ain't a citizen of this world. I, I, I got a right to travel. I got a right to do this. I got a right to do that because I, I'm, I'm of, not of this. I'm not a citizen of your thing. Now think of it in the kingdom of God. You are a sovereign. You in this world, but not of this world. What can this world say to you? You are a king. And not just a king, but a priest. That word priest means, means a priest who offers the sacrifice. The high priest. Like Aaron. Because it's our reasonable service to present ourselves a living sacrifice. You are kings and priests. Temple of the Holy Ghost. Jesus showed us how we were going to change over. And in the coming kingdom, get this. I promise you, I'm about almost done in just a little bit. Seriously. Seriously. The, 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 the coming kingdom, like I said, it's not a cartoon. The coming kingdom ain't churches high-fiving each other with backpacks on and doing stuff. That ain't the coming kingdom. I don't know. You know, backpacks, it sounds like what we do, right? <laughs> Y'all tripping. We have backpacks. I got a drawer full of backpacks that y'all never invited enough people to get them out of there. So <laughs> now we're going to start giving away as first time gifts now. Like, I don't know. Hey, get a backpack. <laughs> um, but the coming kingdom is more physical and, than, than this physical realm. Hear this. It is more physical than this physical realm. The coming kingdom is more spiritual than any spiritual experience you have ever had. 
and yet still more physical than this realm. It is more filled with life. Don't forget, there's no sun and moon. It's his glory that lights it. And he is life. It is, it is buzzing. It is happening. It is, it is where you want to be. There is so much life happening in the kingdom. Because in his father's house, there were many mansions, right? There are cities and delegates and rulers over cities. And there are 12 thrones and there are big pearl gates and streets made of gold. Imagine how popping it got to be. If we're driving on gold. Around here, you get a little bit of gold on your wrist, a little bit on your necklace. You can put some trim, some gold light trim on your car. But what happens when you take all of that and throw it on the street and say we run? Well, then, then if we're driving on gold, what we driving? Uh, it's it's more life happening there than here. It's feel it's more exciting. So exciting. And, and, and I'm trying to paint a picture because we've been told other things. It's, so, it's more desirable, that kingdom. And, I, and I'm trying to paint a picture because, because look at the lie in the light kingdom. We've been taught the opposite. We've been taught the party is in hell. When you're growing up, but when you're foolish with your mouth, you say things like, I don't care if I go to hell. I'm just going to party when I get. That's where all my friends is at. So hell was exciting and party filled and, and the devil was just a DJ. Right. <laughs> and, and, the, and the funny thing is, this is what people really think. That it's just going to be a party in the afterlife and, and they can live like hell here and it's going to be hell there. And, and, and then the kingdom is portrayed as boring. Really boring. I mean, I'm a pastor and the things that I have heard about the kingdom is boring. I'm like, I almost don't want to go. <laughs> like, like, Lord, why don't you come back just a little later? Let me live it out here. <laughs> yeah. Because that sounds boring. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> Like, they portray the kingdom as some boring worship service for eternity. <laughs> this is what people think, right? We're just, we just going to sit there and we're just going to worship all day long forever, right? And, and, and it's some boring thing, which seemingly then would appear to be a downgrade from this. Because I enjoy this. This is how people think, right? And... And, and uh, so what you find is then no one with that idea is in a hurry to change. Yeah. Right. Rather, would just let, let me live it up now. Yeah. Have all my fun now because eventually I'm going to go to that boring place you're talking about. <laughs> and I'd hate to give it up early here and have to live boring on the earth <laughs> and then boring afterwards. So, your sales pitch about Jesus, outside of salvation, which happens in an instant, right, um, is not very co convincing. Because like, okay, well, after that change, what are I going to do? Be bored. And it's, the, the funny thing about it is it only, it only is portrayed like that in the kingdom because it's foreshadowed by us and our idea of living for Jesus here. Because we believe living for Jesus in the earth is a downgrade. That I don't get to have fun no more. That I, that I what am I going to do? I'm just going to go to church all the time, read the Bible all the time. I don't get to go out. I don't get to have friends. I don't get to enjoy myself. I don't get to do this. And we got all this list of don't do's. And you don't really realize, you know, there's really uh, infinity things you can do and have a good time. Yet, yet we, 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 we look at salvation as a prison. No, it's a release of the prisoner. But if we think salvation is a downgrade to life on earth, and then we pitch a boring kingdom that's coming as a downgrade to life on earth, or even at least going to hell. That's the light kingdom, going the other way, like a kingdom. And, 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 and here's the thing. There's, like I said, there's going to be a remembrance of the things that are here because God ain't coming to destroy the earth. What's the scripture say? The scripture said that I read that, that the creation was subjected to frustration, right, by the one who subjected it in hope because it's going to be delivered. 
for the kingdom of, for the children of God. That means that God is going to redeem the earth. Yeah, he's going to pour his wrath out and deal with this and deal with that. But, but he's not looking at the earth like, man, I really blew it when I made that. Got to scrap it and start again. Right. No, this is his earth. It's beautiful. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. That's why the scripture says the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our God and his Christ. Because he's not going to destroy everything. No, there's going to be beauty all around us. And the kingdom is going to come on earth as it is in heaven. And his will is going to be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is how he told us to even pray right now. And, and, and so, you know what won't last? Anything the Lord didn't build. You know, unless the Lord builds the house. They labor in vain who build it. This is where the old folks talk about jewels in your crown. The better, the better way to word that is what you built in the Lord. You, which is why we try to say you ain't got to wait till you old to get saved because then you're going to stand before him and find out 75% of your life you were building without God and when he shakes the earth it won't last the only thing that lasts is his word so if it was built on a word that's what he said you hear a word and do it it's likened it to a man who built upon a rock so if it's built on that rock it's going to stand the shaking a lot of people are going to walk in to their mansion with a lot of works that God is going to say, come on in, good and faithful. And some are going to slide in. Take the one from the one who got one, give it to the one who got ten. Who have, he's going to have more. He who don't have what he seems to have is going to be taken from him. But he still get to go and live in the kingdom. He just don't rule in the kingdom. And so what, what, what stands and what lasts in this coming kingdom and, and be, is a part of what is liberated from decay is what is built by God. We, uh, in a glimpse, is what you see. When you look at me, you look at a glimpse. When you look at yourself in the mirror, you look at a glimpse of what you're going to be yeah. in the future. Yeah. If you're saved, right? right. If, you're, if you're born again, yeah. and you, are, you are a glimpse now of what you're going to be. Yeah. Yeah. Let me explain it to you. We are in a weird space. Jesus introduced and launched the new creation at the cross. When he shed his blood, he launched the new creation. And when he comes back, he'll be completing the new creation. It'll be completed. And we get to exist in between the launching of the new and the completing of the new. And we are new in the part that's not new. We're new creations in an earth that's bound to decay. So we're awaiting him to complete it. But we're not waiting on him so that we can be active. What we're doing in the meantime is we're introducing this newness. We're taking the launch so that when he brings it in complete, all of this is not lost. We are redeeming. We have a ministry of reconciliation. We are making sure that the lost hear the word. And so, so we're bringing this newness in an area of decay. It's a weird time. And... Um, Imagine being the only one alive among the dead. That's where we walk right now. And you have the ability to, and to give this launching of this new creation to somebody else. And, and so while we're waiting for him to bring the kingdom, we are actively walking because as a new creation, the kingdom of God is at hand kingdom of God is near. The kingdom of God is inside you. These are the things that Jesus taught. So while we're waiting for him to come back with his kingdom, we have that kingdom inside of us. Why? Because we're ambassadors. We brought it with us. Ain't no man in this earth authorized me. Ain't no man in this earth authorized you. You brought it with you. You brought him with you. And what we have to do then in this space is we have to live in this present time, get this, by a future standard. Because he knew the end from the beginning. 
And really, we should get in that Bible and work backwards. We should see where we're going and then walk backwards to see how do we get there. Uh, uh, we have a future standard of kingdom living that we should be living by now in the present time. Which means if you are a king and a priest, what should you be now? If you are a ruler there, what you, what's, what's the standard of how you should live now? Yeah. If there is authority in you there, seated in heavenly places there, how can we operate like we're not while we're here? If you have peace there, where's your peace here? If you are filled with joy there, where's your joy here? If you got patience and long-suffering there, how come you so rowdy and, and hair, hair trigger? Here. No, 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 no. We got to live in a present time by a future standard because we already are the new creation and a world that's waiting for the revealing of the sons of God so it can be liberated back to us. So we operate as ambassadors, which means when I'm here, I come from the, I am a citizen of heaven. I am a citizen of the kingdom of God. I am a son of God and co-heir with Christ. So when I'm here, I look around and I understand as an ambassador, like I've taught before, you have to be hospitable to me. Earth, you have to be hospitable to me. Kingdoms of this world, you have to be hospitable to me. Banking industry, you have to be hospitable to me. Every oppressor, you can oppress your people because they're slaves. I'm an ambassador. I am immune from your persecution. I am immune from your prosecution. So if you try to bring it to me, and I know you will, and we're going to fight about it, but none of your charges will stick. None of your accusations will measure up. You cannot say anything to me to make me feel like I'm lost, a failure, or convince me to go back into slavery. I am an ambassador, and it is really your responsibility to make sure that I am provided a home in this land. It is really your responsibility to make sure I am provided a car in this land. So if you keep pressing me, let me tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to stop praying to God about it, and I'm going to start demanding of you it. I'm going to charge it to your account. One thing, the devil, the devil better let you pray and leave you be. Because if you turn around and start declaring, thus saith the Lord as an ambassador, and start operating by that future standard now, if you press me hard enough, say, I've only been interested in reaching my brethren and reaching those who are lost, but if you press me hard enough, I'll start tearing your kingdom down now. See, this is, there's a boundary. They know they got a time. So when they stand before Jesus, they tremble and say, have you come to torments before our time? They need to see that image on you. Oh, the devil should run up to you and think he can press you. Uh, he should be looking at you when you turn around and he say, hold on, it's not my time. I thought I, thought I had this. I thought I had it. <laughs> but it's not my time. Father God, we thank you for who you are. You are our king. Father, you are our king, and you are the king of kings. And Father, we are kings placed by you, co-heirs with you, Christ, and, and priests. Father, let us walk in that authority. Empower us as ambassadors. Not just, Father, the power of the Spirit, but, Father, empower us in our own understanding. That when we walked out and, and began to uh, move in this place, that we wouldn't be hypnotized by the movement of this world that we wouldn't be brought back into bondage but that we would walk out in authority expose the light kingdom expose every false light and father let us let us know you by your voice and know you by your word and let us not want to reap benefits from you without standing on the faith of what we know in you God, continue to develop us. Develop us in a, in a way, Father, that the development pours off into others that we can develop. God, let us bring your kingdom now on earth as it is in heaven. Let us have your will done now as it is in heaven. Let it be on earth now. Let it be in our words. 
Let it be in our ministry of reconciliation. Father, let us look around and not be okay when we see our brothers and sisters enslaved to a lie. Give us the strength to speak up, to negotiate your kingdom, to give your terms. And Father, we say we'll do it. If you lead it, we'll follow. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. It was dry up here for a minute. Man, he came in and baptized it, didn't he? He just splashed. <laughs> when you came in, you received an envelope. That envelope says tithe and offering. If you didn't, our ushers have them. You can slip your hand up if you need one. We believe the tithe is our covenant. The word tithe means tenth. Um, and it is what God told us to bring into the storehouse and our offering is over and above that it is our sacrifice uh, there's digital ways you can give as well if you're watching online it's in the chat we believe giving is worship whether it be tithe whether it be offering it's all to God it's all considered holy and he's the one who really receives it which is why he's always instructing us in our giving that the condition of our heart when we give is important that's why he loves a cheerful giver and we shouldn't give begrudgingly because the condition of our heart when we give corrupts the gift a large gift from a bad heart is not worship that's why the bible says give what you set in your heart to give so as you prepare that uh maybe you gotta repent about something when you was mad about me taking the offering Somebody need to notify their face that they all right. Tell them they happy, that you're happy. Put a smile on it. <laughs> Some of y'all online, quick draw McGraw, trying to hurry up and close out before I take the offering. Devil is a liar. <laughs> you hit that giving link now. Hit that cash app. <laughs> Father God, we thank you for the privilege to give to your kingdom. Everything we have, everything we have belongs to you. And anything we have, we have because of you. So, Father, we give you this portion back, God. We're excited to do it. We're happy to do it. We're honored to do it, that you would even accept an offering from us. And so, God, we give it back to you. We ask you to uh, stretch it out and expand it and do more with it than humanly possible. And, Father, let it be a testimony to your glory of how you provide for your people when they are faithful to your word. Let it overflow and you pour out. Open the windows of heaven and pour out more than there's room enough to receive upon your people. That when others are in a drought, when others are without, Father, you have preserved your people. Let there be a testimony in the world about how blessed your people are. Just like David heard about what was going on at Obed-Edom's house when the ark was there. Put that anointing on your people in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen.